May the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery. And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby land where maybe we can find some self-confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online! vacation. Um, I enjoyed the week that I got to spend with Sweetie Pie. Uh, We went on a, uh, what was going to be a, uh, a, a Gulf of Mexico cruise. And the day that we got on board the cruise ship, and I figured they were going to do this, um, they changed all of the destinations because we were scheduled to leave Miami, Florida and uh, travel by boat um, to Honduras, Belize, Cozumel, Mexico, and I love Cozumel. I've been there one time, and there's just a, a, the water is absolutely amazing. It looks like the Tidy Bowl man basically just spread his love all over that ocean there around Cozumel, Mexico. Nice, clear blue water. However, uh, Hurricane Barrel was barreling right toward that. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Hoggy, they're either going to cancel this cruise or they're going to change where you're going. And so we got on board and then we found out that they changed. And I'm glad. I'm glad they didn't cancel it. That would have been very upsetting. Um, cause I just, I don't, uh, I love people. God bless you. If you live in this area, I don't like Miami. I don't like Miami. Um, I, yeah, I just don't, I just, I just don't. And so I would not necessarily go to Miami on purpose unless I had a different reason for being there. And that's where the cruise ship, we, we traveled Norwegian. And um, so anyway, uh, we ended up visiting uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, We ended up uh, on St. Thomas, which is American uh, Virgin Islands. We visited, I can't remember the next, I can't remember the next uh, island, but it was British Virgin Islands. And this is a neat story. Um, we get off the boat. Um, Lisa likes to do a little shopping, so we're doing a little shopping, you know, just off off the pier, uh, because they all want the, you know, they want your money. Tourism is big in those islands. Uh, they used to grow sugar cane and sell sugar or make rum out of it. Uh, but these islands, over the years, figured out that there's more money to be made on tourism. I remember a few years ago, we went on a tour, uh, on a cruise, and um, we visited this island in, in the, the uh, Caribbean, 
and it was a self-governing island. In other words, it wasn't a colony of the Netherlands or Great Britain or anything like that. 80% of the people who were citizens of this island nation worked for the government. 80%. Now, the number one commodity that this island had was tourism. It was a place where you got Norwegian, Carnival Cruise Lines, Royal Caribbean, uh, what is it, P&G out of Britain. They all show up at these islands. And this, this particular island was one of those where they used to grow sugar cane. And they said, forget this. There's more money to be made from Americans and Europeans coming here and throwing money all over the place. So 80% of the people, they worked in, the government owned all of the, um, the stores. The government owned the, um, the, like the curio shops and the tourist traps and all of that stuff. The government owned it. And the people that worked for these places where you went and bought souvenirs and stuff like that, the people that worked there, they got paid a set amount every month. They got a check from the government just for being a citizen of this island. Now, if they had them a job, they would put them to work, either working at the pier or working in some form of the tourist trade. And you could tell the difference. If you go to a country and you – second world, third world, whatever, you go to their, their tourist shops, they will not let you walk out of the store unless you've bought something. And I mean, they will hound you, they will harass you, and you got to understand, this is their livelihood, okay? So I'm not complaining about it, it's just the way it is. It's because the more they sell, the more money they make. But on this particular island, you could tell that they were paid by the government a set amount every month because they didn't care if I bought anything or not. We'd pull up to this. We, we did a tour of this island, and the tour guide uh, had us stop at one of these little curio places alongside the roadway, and it was a sightseeing thing, and they had a, had a bathroom, a baños. And um, they charged for the bathroom, by the way. So we get out, and the shopkeepers, there was three of them, they's all sitting around like this. And when you wanted anything, they would go over there. And I'm like, don't you want to sell me something? Don't you care? And the truth of it is, they didn't care. They got paid whether that store made any money, any profit or not. They didn't care. That's the socialism slash communism experiment in full force. The workers, they don't care. If in, in fact, it's annoying when somebody shows up to buy something. They got to get up count the money out, oh my goodness, sometimes they have to bend over, my word, the, 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 oh, that's terrible, so anyway, back to this past week, uh, we, we went on this island, and we were standing there, I had no idea what we were doing, and a man spoke to us, he was a taxi driver, and he said, do you guys need help with anything? And I said, you know what? Maybe. I might be looking you up here in a minute. So we walked around trying to see what was available, nothing from the, from the ship. And so I walked back over there, and he caught my attention again. He said, did you find what you're looking for? And I said, well... We want to take a tour of the island. Do you give tours of the island? He said, yes, sir. This is an, uh, an older gentleman. Um, 
black and we started we got on the we got in his taxi real nice taxi a minivan and he starts driving us around the island showing us all the neat places and going up on top of the mountain you could see forever and he mentioned something about uh, we were talking about fruit that he likes. He likes persimmons, and we have a persimmon tree here at the church. And I said, we, I said, behind our church, we have a persimmon tree. As the conversation went, about 15 minutes later, he said, did I hear you say you were a pastor? I said, no, I didn't say that, but I am. He was a pastor too. <gasps> really? And so all of a sudden, we started talking. And he said, what denomination are you? I said, Bautista, Baptist. He said, we're Baptist. And he said, we have a small church. I said, I have a small church. I said, small churches are the best, right? They are. Where's my? <laughs> they are the best. And all of a sudden now, we're talking shop for the last 30 minutes of this ride. Absolutely enjoy, uh, enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, the man sees exactly the same things that we're seeing, that there is corruption everywhere. There's corruption in the denominations. There's corruption in the churches. It's getting worse and worse. And he, he said, you know, America used to stand for something. They used to, uh, they used to be... Uh, said they used to send out missionaries all over the world, and now look at them. And I said, buddy, I agree with you 100%. And uh, it was just a joy to be able to talk to this man. And God, there's no doubt God put this man in my path for whatever reason. And uh, turns out he's got a YouTube channel, and he makes videos, and he talks about stuff that he knows is wrong in this world. Like the opposite of me, all right? Anyway, so it is good to be with you today. Oh, I got a new cup. DI stands for very important. Um, somebody's asked me to turn my volume up. Let me try that. Hey, is that better? No, that stands for uh, Virgin Islands. And uh, I like the look of the cup, so. All right, what are we going to talk about today? Um, I was working on something uh, related to Kundalini. Uh, because I found a film, documentary film, yesterday on YouTube. Um, I had to pay to rent it. And um, it basically extols all the praises and all the blessings that you receive from uh, doing yoga and meditation and letting that serpent that's coiled up at the base of your spine, the last three vertebra of your spine... And what's that number? The number of bones in your spine is 33. Think about that for a while. Um, and those bottom three vertebra do not have any contact with the spinal cord. In other words the messages sent down the spinal cord from the brain do not reach the bottom three vertebra. It's like they're dead. And that part of your spine is called the sacrum, and it ends in the coccyx, or however you pronounce that. Um, but I think that's significant because I think it represents hell. Think of, think of the symbolism. Here I am talking about it, and I wasn't going to talk about it today. But think about the symbolism of it. The bottom of your spine representing hell. So what would the head represent? Heaven. This is where God is. 
the mind of God. This is where uh, he is the most high. There's nothing higher than our heads. God says as, as high uh, up, as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts to your thoughts and my ways to your ways. So God sends down what he desires uh, in the body's life and it reaches all throughout the body except the very tail end of your spine. And that's where they say this coiled up serpent. And this coiled up serpent is a female, not a male. And I just love it when people who do not understand anything about Christianity try to tell us Christians that we've got it all wrong. I just, I really love that. Uh, Or people that never, ever read the Bible, but they know about Ezekiel's wheel, and they know a few things that Jesus said, and they like to take those and tell us who study the Bible every day and make it a part of our life and try to conform our life to the image given to us in scriptures. I like it when these people try to tell us what the Bible really says. I'm going to you guys. So anyway, I'm not going to talk about that today at all. I'm not going to say another word. Um, I want to talk about the translation. Not the Bible translation. Although, it could be, could be a link there. Our rapture. The word rapture, it's not a dirty word. You've got naysayers out there on social media who are putting out this idea that the word rapture, since it's not in the Bible, then it doesn't exist. Hang on. It actually is in the Bible. In the Latin Bible. I didn't say Latin Vulgate. I said the Latin Bible, where in the Greek, in 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, where it says caught up, the Latin word there is the same word where we get the word rapture. And it means caught up, just like the Bible says. So don't People, don't be afraid of using this word. And if somebody tries to nail you and say, oh, there is no rapture, that's a false doctrine. That was put up by these people back in the 1800s, and it's a false doctrine. There's not going to be right. We're going to have to go through all of this stuff. Just say, look, I, you know, I don't know what Bible you're reading, but 1 Thessalonians 4 says there is. 1 Corinthians 15 says there is. Enoch said there was, and Elijah says there was. So there's your witnesses right there. Let's look at what Jesus said, John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And I like what my Savior said here about us being troubled. I get troubled, you get troubled, we get concerned, we're worried, we don't know the future, we don't know what's going to happen. This is God making us subject to vanity. Since we cannot see the future, we can't even see one second into the future. We cannot see the future. We don't know what's coming around the river bend or around the corner or down a few miles. We have no idea what's coming our way. But God does. And if God told us, do not be afraid, fear not, see that you be not troubled. If he said that to us, then he means it. And he's actually blessing us, and I believe that in the day wherein men's hearts are failing them for fear, I believe that God, His Holy Spirit, will manifest Himself in me, and I, who am naturally afraid of things, will not fear. Because that's the devil's, one of his main 
um, fiery darts is fear and trouble. The idea of being troubled, the idea of being in tribulation, the idea of being in deep sorrow, all of those things, that's, that's the devil's way of getting us to back down, push away, and say, I can't do this. I can't live for God. It's going to be too dangerous. And believe it or not, I actually believe there are some people who justified walking away from God by saying, if I leave God, the devil will leave me alone. But it's not true. You walk away from God, the devil will just own you. He won't leave you alone. He's going to make sure you never go back, ever. Anyway, uh, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. No, that's, that, is, that is not mm. what it says. Mansions. Many mansions. Can you imagine us singing? I've got a room just over the hilltop in that bright land where... Can you imagine us singing that that way? I've got a mansion just over the... See, I like it better. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That is Christ himself telling both what he's going to do and why he's going to do it. Why is Jesus going to appear in the clouds? So that he can receive us unto himself. He's not coming down here to the earth at that time. We are going up to meet him in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And whither I go you know and the way you know. Thomas, gotta love Thomas, saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ is the only mediator between God and men. Not Mary, not St. Joseph, not St. Ignatius de Loyola, not St. Teresa of Avila, not St. Benedict, not, not any of these rascals. None of them are praying for you right now. None of them are. That is a, you know what you're doing to all of our Catholic friends out there? You know what you're doing? You're putting other gods before God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And when the Roman Catholic prays to these various saints, they're praying to gods. They have put gods before the one and true almighty God. All right, so Jesus established it. He said it in no uncertain terms. When I prepare this place for you, I will come again. I will receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Never, ever to be separate from our Lord Jesus Christ ever again. Hallelujah. All right. Acts chapter 1. shows the sign of this appearing. And I think this is really, really important. I, I mean, the way that the number of times that the Bible, the New Testament especially, some in the Old Testament, but the way the Bible emphasizes 
Christ coming in the clouds. That tells me something. It tells me that it's possible, could I say probable, that when the Antichrist appears, there will be an absence of clouds. Because of the, the number of times Jesus said, well, look at Acts chapter 1, 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He left in a cloud. He's coming back in a cloud. That's how we'll recognize that it's him, is that he's going to be in the clouds. Mark that down. Put it in the back of your mind somewhere and remember it because I think it's important. You know, when your teacher in school always said, now, see what I'm writing on the board? You might want to write this down. It's possible that what I'm writing will end up on the test that you're being given Friday. And, of course, you know what Mike Hogger did. I didn't write it down. That was too much work. One of the things God refined in me in 1997 when God laid on my laid the burden on my heart to study prophecy. Um the the thing that God laid on my heart and they, what he corrected in me was my lazy attitude towards study. And I realized that if I was going to be a student of the Word of God, I need to have notebooks. And so I got those little, uh, I don't know if I have any in here. Uh, you can get them for a dollar at the dollar store. You can get them from Walmart cheaper. I don't know why. But anyway, uh, it's these little notebooks. You just start writing stuff in there. It's got lines on the pages, so you keep in the lines and and I tell you what, I've filled up probably four or five of those in the early years of this ministry. And I just started writing all of it down. And whenever, whenever God emphasizes to us something over and over and over again, it's intended that we pay attention to that because that is important. Some people don't see the relevance of it. I may not quite understand the full relevance of it, but I guarantee you when Christ appears, there's going to be clouds. When Antichrist appears, I don't think there's going to be a single cloud anywhere. Just, just my thought. 1 Thessalonians 4. Actually, something neat about 1 Thessalonians is that every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, mentions something about the rapture. Look at this one. Chapter 1. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. There it is right there. To wait for his Son from heaven. That's what we're doing now. We're waiting for his Son from heaven. Because he's going to deliver us from what? Wrath. God has not appointed us to wrath. To all my dispensational friends, I respectfully disagree with the idea that nothing happens before the rapture and 
that they take the word tribulation and they say that is the wrath of God. But it's not. While God has not appointed us to wrath, clearly in the scriptures, not in somebody's book, not in Schofield notes, not in uh, uh, any of these um, any of these authors of books now who stand on a what's called a pre-tribulation rapture, many of them, not all of them, but many of them try to make you believe that the tribulation is the wrath of God. But just study the word tribulation in the scripture, King James scriptures. You will find contrary wise that we must through tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. That's just one verse. There's others. Do your own study. So he has delivered us from the wrath to come. Look at chapter 2. Usually it's at the end. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are ye not even are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. So our hope and our joy and our crown of rejoicing is not based upon anything that is down here on earth or anything that is happening here on this earth. If you are relying on an earthly thing to give you joy, to give you peace, to give you hope, if you're relying on that, that will fail you and it will do it every time. The, the beliefs in things of this world is like the morning fog. It fades away quickly. One minute it's there, next minute it's gone. And so if you have, if you have told your heart that you're not going to be happy until you achieve so much in your salary or until you have the nice four-bedroom, three-and-a-half bath uh, house that you've always wanted um, or, you know, getting your dream job or marrying this trophy wife or husband or whatever that you're not going to be happy until those things take place. I'm here to tell you. God will burn the house down. God will make you go bankrupt. And God will let the devils come in and split your marriage all up. God will let the spoilers in to spoil everything that you think gives you joy, gives you hope, gives you peace. Our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing is our presence when Jesus Christ appears in the air. Oh, I love it. Chapter 3. Look at this. And Lord, make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish when you establish Stab something, it sticks there. Remember that Latin prefix? It is S-T-E or S-T-A or S-T-O or S-T-U. ST, it's any of the vowels. S-T and a vowel. Stuck. Status. Stage. Statute. Statue. Stop. Start. Stay. Establish, establish. How many words in English come from that one root 
S-T and a vowel. It's a Latin, Latin root. It's amazing, but it basically means something that once it's put there, it's never, ever, ever going to move. It's going to be as sure as the rock of Gibraltar. So the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Hallelujah. That's just a little bit loud. Let me try that again. Now it didn't play it at all, did it? Let me check one. Hmm. Let's see here. There we go. All right. Now, of course, now chapter 4. We know where it is. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord. Means it's got authority to it. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, when Jesus appears, those of us who are alive... We're not the only ones who's going to get the resurrection. The dead in Christ are going to get it too. We're not going to prevent them from getting it, which are asleep. They are, they are sleeping the sleep of death. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first because they died first. These having died, all died in faith. And so to those who are in the grave, those who are in the ground, those who are in the sea, those who are obliterated, God knows how to build a new body out of one that doesn't even exist anymore. That's how powerful our God is. And no, you don't have to worry about when you die, them cutting your heart out or your lungs or you donating your organs. I, I, I've even seen people that donated their, their knees and elbows. Yeah, that's a thing. Don't worry about that. You're not going to need them ever again. And God is not going to say, uh, excuse me, uh, we've got some things missing on the checklist here that was part of your body. Do you happen to know where they are, sir? And if we can't account for them, I'm sorry, but there'll be no resurrection for you. We must have every piece intact or no resurrection. It's not like that. Um, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Here is the mentioning again of clouds. Wherefore, comfort. Oh, I like this word. Sixty six times yes 33 times 2 6 times 11 66 times 1 number of books in the bible we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope you know the best the best remedy to those, and I got an email today from somebody who is struggling. And I gave them some biblical advice, but I'm going to give you something else too. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God does not 
say, I'm sorry for calling each one of you and myself into his glorious kingdom. He's not ever going to be sorry that he did. Why? Because God knows the outcome of your life, the outcome of your life, the outcome of my life. And God knows that the thing that he hath begun in you, he will continue to do it until that day. So that's something to have hope in. That when you are, like I said, when you're down, when you're burdened, when you're depressed, when you are in deep sorrow and contrition over your sins, I got to tell you this. I'm reading a book now, and I, I think I'm going to deal with this subject during homecoming, which will be August 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Hooray! And it's a book about the history and the making of our King James Bible. The lead translator, the man really who was responsible for the output of the King James Bible, and don't misunderstand me, he wasn't lord and dictator over all the translating processes, and he didn't take all the manuscripts and, and cross out what he didn't like and put in what he wanted. He just led by his example. The man knew and spoke 17 languages. That qualifies him. But according to what I read, he spent five hours a day, the first five hours of his day, he spent in deep prayer. Usually, it was remorse, confession, repentance of his sinful, wicked nature. He started writing down the prayers that he would pray during those times. Before he died, he gave the manuscript of all of those prayers that he recorded. He gave that manuscript to a friend of his, and they had it published. And if I remember right what I read to this day, the uh, various vicars and bishops and archbishops of the Church of England have those prayers in their prayer book. They have a prayer book. They read prayers. But they still survive to this day. That's the kind of man, number one, that I'd like to be. Number two, it's the kind of man that I would trust that they would seek God before they ever sat down with a pen in their hand and began to translate the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek into English. That's the kind of man that I would trust that they would seek the Lord first before they ever wrote a letter down. Compare that to Jesuit Carlos Martini, who was on the Greek New Testament Committee of the International Bible Society. Now that he's passed on, it's another Jesuit priest. And I dare say their lifestyle more than likely involves sins of the abominable kind, 
what God calls an abomination. I don't know why I got off on that, but let me just say to you, if you ever doubt your salvation and you're afraid that when Christ appears in the air that you will not be ready, then go to the Scriptures, my friends. Go to the Bible. Read it. Be comforted. Let God remind you of what He's already told you. And those things that He's told you, He's told to us from the Scriptures. Let God lead you into those Scriptures or new Scriptures. New Scriptures. Same Bible. But things that you may have read before but didn't get any relevance out of it. Now God's going to make it relevant for you. I'm just saying the, the, uh, the cure for the spiritual doldrums, when there's no wind for the sails to move the sailboats, the cure for that and the remedy for that is the comfort of Scriptures. Amen. Hallelujah. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, we have to have for any doctrine that we believe, it doesn't matter what it is, if it's a doctrine about God, if it's a doctrine about Christ or the Holy Spirit, if it's a doctrine about the blood in our salvation, if it's a doctrine about faith in our salvation or grace in in salvation or how the law plays in salvation or whatever, or... um, to confirm doctrines related to the Bible and the issue of the Bible, whether or not it's pure right now or not, all of those should come from Scripture, and there should be at least two witnesses. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So, if we're going to believe, this rapture, being caught up, translated, going to heaven without dying, or if we die, we're going to be resurrected, which that's what it is. The rapture is the first resurrection because he's going to scoop up all the people that were in the graves and he's going to give them a new body. That's resurrection. They're going to live again. So we go to 1 Corinthians 15. It's another, let me back up just for a second. You know, I I count things. And when I counted the things, I can't do that. When I counted the things that were related to the rapture, I noticed that there were five things. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. This is going to be relevant here in a little bit. With the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Five things. So, we go to 1 Corinthians 15. Guess what? Five things. And... 15, that's three times five. Behold, I show you a mystery. You want to see something? Come on, Hoggy. Watch this. One, two, three, four, five. Fit the currents of the word mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, a blink, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. I can't wait some days. I want out of this vile body so bad... I can't, I can't stand myself sometimes. 
But five things, and this is a this is now a second witness to the fact of the rapture, the translation, the resurrection of all the saints everywhere and at every time. Okay? Titus 2.11. Oh, I like, I like this. You know what? I hang on a second. I remember something. Grace of God. Wait a minute. No, that ain't it. There's a connection with the grace of God in the number five. I can't remember what it was. Maybe I should read the book I wrote on it. I don't know. But anyway, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now, if somebody asks you, what about these people that, that was talking about a tribe that lives in the Amazon jungle? Yeah, what about those people? They've never heard Jesus. They don't, they don't know English. They can't read a Bible. They've never even heard of a Bible. They, even, they just have their own gods. Won't they go to heaven too? I mean, that's, after all, it's not fair, you know, because nobody ever told them anything. Now, listen. If the plan is based upon the idea that if they don't know anything about God, Jesus Christ, or salvation— they get a free pass. They can go to heaven automatically because they don't know. If that's the, the basis of what we believe, then why did we send missionaries to go tell them? Why did we do that? Why would we spend so much time in Kenya? Why would... The, the gospel need to be preached to the entire world if by leaving people alone and them not hearing anything about Christianity, they automatically go to heaven? But the answer is they don't. If you take this, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, and then you add that to Romans 1, um, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. It's plain as day to me now. Somehow, some way, God's grace has appeared to all men. And nobody has an excuse for not following Jesus Christ because somehow, some way, God revealed it to them, to all all mankind, so that they are without excuse. They can't get to heaven and say, God, I didn't know. I mean, you are God, right? I mean, I, I admit, I mean, I'm fuzzy on this. I mean, I just didn't know anything. So, you know, why don't you just give me a break? Listen, ignorance of the law is not justification for breaking the law. You should know that doesn't work in man's court, and it's not going to work in God's either. But the bottom line is, God doesn't leave them ignorant. He reveals himself to them. He, it's appeared to all men. But then men take it and quickly shut it out, or they take what God has shown them and they dress it up and to make it into something else. They've changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image of corruptible man, four-footed beast, uh, fowls of the air, and creeping things. 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, people, the things you lust after, they will condemn you. I'm telling you, you do not yield nor give in to your lusts. Did I say that? Because I've done it. I don't like it. I don't like to admit it. I don't like to talk about it. But I've done it. Deny yourself those things. Do things that are related to godliness and learning godly habits. We should live soberly, Rodney Howard Brown, righteously, Joel Osteen, and godly, Rick Warren. Those are not examples of sober, righteous, and godly people. In this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the way, did, did not the Bible just say that God is Jesus Christ? Did it not just say that? I think it said it. The glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I think, I think the Bible just said that God is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is God. 2 Thessalonians 2. I didn't, I didn't take long to empty that one out. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and here's a study for you, our gathering together unto him. Now think Bible on this. Think of the, the parable of the tares and the wheat. What happens to the tares when it's time for harvest? They're gathered together and bundled, aren't they? Now let's stop right here for a minute. I told you at the beginning of this that I've been doing some study on kundalini. It's related to other uh, Hindu or Buddhist belief systems. Um, there is a term called samadhi, not somebody, samadhi. And in, when you achieve samadhi, you get this overwhelming feeling that you are connected physically, emotionally, and spiritually to every atom in the entire universe. Edgar Mitchell, sixth man to walk on the moon. How do I know that? Because he always signed his name, Edgar Mitchell, sixth man to walk on the moon. On his way back from the lunar surface, it's a three-day ride, you don't pull over to go to the bathroom. He is looking out the window of the Apollo 14 capsule. He's looking at all the stars. Yes, you can see the stars in space. Flatheads. He's looking at all of them, and he, it dawns on him because he believes in evolution that all of the atoms that make up his body and his presence in the earth at that particular time, all of those atoms have been around since the beginning of the Big Bang, according to them. That those atoms were part of this cosmic dust this cosmic dust goes out and it starts forming 
stars and then forming star clusters called galaxies, forming the constellations, and then those atoms went to our sun. The sun uh, spit out some of its material. Now we have some planets there, and the planets get formed, and all of a sudden life shows up, and then, you know, 500 million years later, Edgar Mitchell is walking on the surface of the moon. And he believes now he has this, and it's demonic. That's another word don't be afraid to use. It is demonic, the belief system that, and, and the experience that happened to him. He believes now that because his atoms were present in the Big Bang, and his atoms at one time were traveling through the cosmos, ended up on this, forming this planet, and all of life stems then from the material that's on this planet. So he believes that he is connected and in a single unit with everything that there is. It's called... What is it called? Pan. Uh, maybe I'm mistaken. I, I'm thinking pantheism or panentheism. But anyway, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, he believes that he's one now. He is linked together, and that there is no individual person. There is no individual planet. There is no individual solar system. There is no individual Milky Way galaxy. There is simply the one. Now that's a new age term for the Antichrist. And it's at the core of Kabbalah teachings. This idea that all of the matter of the universe was in this very, very tight, compacted state and it exploded all throughout space, and um, that in that beginning clump of matter resided Adam Kadmon, the, the Kabbalah's Messiah the divine being who was in all material things. Madonna is a Kabbalist. You've been studying Kabbalah for years. One of, the, one of the teachings of Kabbalah is that there is a difference between us in our material bodies living in a material world and the... Um, celestial body and the celestial worlds. So she sings one of her number one hits, Material Girl. This is a material world and I'm a material girl. Now everybody thought that it was about her love affair with things, that she had all this money, she could buy whatever she wanted. But she's conveying Kabbalistic teachings in there. Anyway, got to move on. The idea of samadhi making you one with everything that's in the, the universe is basically the setup for the gathering of the tares in the last days. And who are the tares? They're the children of the wicked one. Who are we? We're children of the Most High God. And so there is going to be a day, people, this mark of the beast I don't, I don't believe that it's, that it's going to be, how can I say this? Do I believe that there is some technology to it? Absolutely. Do I believe that it's the, the, uh, the RFID microchip? Not necessarily. There's something about the mark that I believe 
once a person has taken it, they immediately and without any resistance whatsoever, they immediately become part of the one. Just as you and I are individual parts of the body of Christ, so also are all of the lost people in this world and all the lost people they're children of disobedience, which means that they are ruled over by the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So all of these lost people, they're going to accept a mark, and it's going to immediately bring their consciousness into oneness with everything else. And listen, Kundalini does that. When you have these third eye opening experiences, which is a farce, by the way, when you have these experiences, you're the one who looks at all the religions of the world and says they're all the same. Because my Kundalini experience, you can find that in Islam, you can find that in Buddhism, you can find that in Shinto religion. You can find that uh, in Christianity. You can find it in Judaism. You can, you can find it in all of the religions everywhere. So right then and there, you have these people who've had this experience. They have already joined in to the, the one consciousness that we are all united together. And that brings with it the idea of communitarianism, which is similar to communism, but communitarianism. Let, let's let's put it in uh, let's put it in in taxation. Communitarianism is says that everybody must pay an equal amount of taxes. And everybody must also receive the exact same pay as everybody else is receiving. They call it wage equality. If you hear that term coming out of a politician's mouth, run from him and vote against him. Because he's bringing in communitarianism. When we put it into salvation terms, communitarianism says this. None of us, none of us can be saved unless all of us are saved. Now, is that true? No, it's not even within a hundred million miles of being true. The fact that a bunch of people refuse God's offer of free salvation does not hinder God's grace applied in my life, forgiving me of my transgressions and saving my soul. Okay? Excuse me. That's the opposite of communitarian, is individualism. When we apply individualism to the wage argument, I have a right to make a living in this country that is commensurate with my intelligence, my skill, my ability to work and do the job that I've been hired to do, and I have the right in this country to earn a higher wage than somebody else who does not put forth any effort, who isn't all together up here, I have that right. But in a communitarian idea, in this communist socialist 
experiment, everybody makes the same amount of money. So a guy does this. If you remember years ago, back when Obama was president, there was a guy following Obama and his rhetoric to Joe the plumber, Obama telling him, hey, I, I believe that when we all, when we spread the wealth around, everybody then benefits. Well, listen, I'm not working for everybody else's benefit. I'm not earning a wage so I can give it out to everybody else. Okay? But anyway, this guy owned a technology company. He had research guys that were brilliant. And we're talking, you know, multi-million dollar co a year company. And all of a sudden, he decides to go full on, full metal jacket socialism. And he gives everybody from his chief research scientist to the guy that empties the trash cans during the night, $75,000. Now, 15 years ago, that was a pretty good chunk of change. Or I think it was like 89000 or something like that. And you know what happened? His scientists quit. They quit. They said, excuse me, we went to school. Seven years we went to school. We got bills to pay. You didn't hire me because you saw how gifted I was at taking the trash out. You hired me because of what I can bring to this company. Now, I'm getting back on track here. Our gathering together, there's two gatherings in the Bible. There's the gathering of the tares. And does it happen second? No. It happens first. Then the wheat, which is golden like the sun, the tares turn black as night. They are gathered together and burnt. The wheat is gathered together and taken to the garner of the husbandman. And you see in that the two gatherings. Go Look at the word gather, gathering, gatherings together. Look at that word all throughout the King James. And you'll start getting an idea. You'll start seeing the typology of it. You know, Absalom gathering together the people as one man, I think is what it says. And uh, so in that picture, you have a picture of the Antichrist who is joining everybody together as one. We're all one unit. Okay? And by the way, the Antichrist gathers everybody together in the field of Megiddo for the battle of Armageddon. Anyway, meanwhile, back at the ranch, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken. Where's the shaking coming from? Well, that's easy. How, how's about Revelations 6? And I beheld it when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. That's a shaking. Verse 14, or verse 13, uh, the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. So you have a shaking going on. Come on, baby, a whole lot of shaking going on. You have a shaking. And the Apostle Paul is telling us, don't be shaken by that. Don't let this mess you up, okay? Don't collapse. When, when the UFO experts are telling everybody that on the day that the government discloses that we do, in fact, have had contact with extraterrestrial races and we have their ships and we have, you know, we're, we're um, reverse engineering them and um, they are our space brethren and they're wanting to come here to make life better for us on this planet. They're going to end nuclear war. They're going to give 
uh, uh, their technology to us and we'll eliminate poverty, we'll eliminate disease, it will be heaven on earth. When they say all that, then they say, on the day that that happens, all the religions of the world will fail. They'll all fall. Now, why is that? Why is that? It's because, let me speak for Christianity. We believe that the earth is the center of everything that surrounds us in the cosmos, no matter how big, how large, and how fast it's expanding. Because the universe is getting bigger, minute by minute. That no matter how big it is, we are at the very core of what God has planned. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Okay, let me ask you a question. Where's hell? Where's hell? When God built hell, where did he put it? He put it, and what was it made for? What was its original intention? May, uh, prepared for the devil and his angels. So where is it? It's in the heart of the earth. That alone tells me that the earth is the core of everything that God has planned, put together, built, created. This earth is. And it lies unique. Now, is it possible that there could be some microbial life on Mars or Io, which is one of Jupiter's moons, or in some planet that they discovered with the James Webb telescope. Um, is it possible that there could be some form of life somewhere else? Why not? I, I don't see anything in Scripture that prevents that. I'm, I don't know personally everything in Scripture. That's why I have to keep reading it. But of the things that I've read, I just, I don't know. I don't see it. Maybe, 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 maybe I'm wrong. Um, but anyway, here's the thing. If we are rooted and grounded in our doctrine and what we believe, if we are prepared with our shield of faith, none of the fiery darts that the devil hurls at us will ever reach their target. None of them will. And he's relentless. Once he's got you on the run, he just keeps throwing them and throwing them and throwing them. Mm. So anyway, don't be shaken. If someday you get up and there are either <laughs> the sky is full of these various UFOs, or <laughs> Sleepy Joe, President Joe, sends Jill out to tell everybody, yeah, we, we've got E.T. We've got the ships. We've been working on them for years, okay? Trying to make them fly. We're not giving it to the Russians. We're not giving it to the Chinese. Unless they pay us really well. The Biden found it. I saw a T-shirt. I saw a T-shirt over the weekend. And it had LGBTQ plus on it. 
and it stood for let's get Biden to quit plus Kamala. <laughs> where's my where's my laughter? I thought that was funny. Anyway, be not shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit. That spirits are troubling. Spirits are troubling. Spirits, they can get to me. Okay? People, not so much, but spirits get to me. Nor by word, nor by letter as from us is that the day of Christ is at hand. Look at this, another gathering. Psalm 50, verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The sacrifice was Christ. The covenant is the New Testament. And the heaven shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Matthew 24. Oh, I like this. And I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask you a, a question. I, and again, I, I just with respect to all my friends, brothers and sisters out there who are of a dispensational persuasion, um, you tend to see things in the light of Clarence Larkin, C.H. Schofield, no, not C.H. Schofield, C.I. Schofield, and dispensationalism. Which means that none of the things, according to that, none of the things in Matthew 24 have anything to do with our translation, our being raptured. Now, I don't agree with that. And the reason why I don't agree with it is based upon what Jesus said, or excuse me, rather what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say that all of these things that he details in Matthew 24, they're not for the Gentiles. He didn't say that. He did not exclude anybody out of his prophecies here. So what he simply said was, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man. What is he doing? He's coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Hallelujah. And he shall send his angels. Now here's why I like this. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. And they shall gather together his elect. Remember, the servants of the husbandmen in the parable of the wheat and the tares. They gathered first the tares, then they gathered the wheat. The servants in that parable are the angels, the gathering angels. They shall gather together his elect. And again, uh, I would go to scriptures if somebody said that the elect can only be Israel. Not true. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 9, 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. There is a reference to Israel, even so then at this present time. Also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Well, that kind of that disagrees with the doctrine that 
this, the gospel, which is, it, this is hyper-dispensationalism, but the gospel for the Jews is a gospel of works salvation. It's works plus grace. That You can't do that. You can't do that. If it's grace, it's not of works. If it's works, if not of grace, you cannot say that the Jews are going to be saved by grace and works. You can't say that. Um, what then? Hath Israel obtained that which he seeketh for? But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Um... Colossians 3.12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. I mean, enough said already. Gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Oh, I like this. Be because, let's see what, see what's coming up here uh, it's too far away meanwhile back at the ranch I have a I have a theory yeah hogger this is where you get in trouble isn't it yeah it's where I get in trouble remember remember what God's chariots are. Remember what they are? According to the book of Psalm, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah and Elisha, I like that. Elijah is the Gentile, and Elisha is the Jew. And does Elijah have anything to do with Elisha's salvation in the double portion? Absolutely. And so... They cross the River Jordan, and this is where Elijah says to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. And uh, it came to pass as they still won and talked, behold, there appeared la, da, 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 a chariot of fire and horses of fire. These were angels. These were angels. So I have a theory. When Christ dispatches all of his angels to go out to the whole world and gather up all of those who are born again. Could it be that those angels, could it be that God had this story written up exactly the way it is to show us that what's coming to get us to take us to Christ is those chariot angels. Chariot angels. Because they are angels. That would be awesome, I think. Now, here's the other side to this. It's the idea that... i got to turn my headphones down here it's hard to talk when you're listening to yourself talk and you're delayed half a second and something's cutting my internet in and out but is it possible then 
if, if that's God's plan, to send these chariot angels down to come and pick us all up like he did with Elijah. Think about then on the opposite side, the Antichrist. Sending chariots to take people from this earth to go live in a far away land which would be another planet. Think about it. We, we would basically have a, a fake rapture, a false rapture, the opposite of the rapture. You would have all of these UFOs popping up everywhere and saying we're gonna we're gonna help with the Earth's population or something like that. We're gonna uh, we're gonna gather up a bunch of people that want to go. And we're gonna take them to our world where they can live there. I I think that there is a basis for that in Scripture. Something to think about. Oh, it's so good to be with you today. Thank you for joining with us. Thank you for your prayers, your love. Thank you for, I'll tell you what I'm thankful for, your love for the Word of God. And you're absolutely standing on the solid rock of God's Word. And you're not going to be removed from it. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I love you. See you tomorrow night for Wednesday Night Bible Study.